Hey, Icon, happy 4th of July. I hope you had some good plans to get out and have a good time today. Um, I'm here for our next sermon in Romans, uh, but before we get started, I uh, just kind of want to bring something back up and, and put it in front of you in order to uh, invite you into something here at Icon. And so, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we announced on this online feed that we are slowly beginning to taper off some of the uh, like online experience that, you know, since the, since COVID began, we really had to shift quite a bit in order to uh, still make our services compelling and something that you could still be encouraged by, even though we were discouraged by the, the forced necessity of having to move online. And so our team from the beginning has killed it. And I know that you see that and you benefit from that each and every week. And so, uh, but the thing is, in order to kill it for that online experience, it takes a lot of manpower and it takes a lot of energy. And now as we are slowly drifting back towards normal, and especially now that a lot of the restrictions are gone and things are going really well every day, I check the King County COVID stats and we are low, like as low as you can get. So things are going really well, well right now, praise God. And because of that, we want to, we want to lean back in some of that energy and some of that team bandwidth into our in-person gatherings. And so our online services are just a little bit shorter. They're not quite as, uh, they're not as long and don't have as many little pieces in them. And that's just, that's not because we don't want you to be encouraged, but because as a team, we need to lean back into in-person services where we feel like God has clearly spoken from his word that, you know, it was good that we were able to do the online thing and do it well for a while out of necessity. But now we believe that our, our conviction is that God desires for us to be together and we want to lean back into that. And so I would invite you, especially right now, because next Sunday, July 11th, we are starting our morning service back up again. And then there's no better of a time for you to come back. We're in a new building. We have a new morning service. We're going to have, we're going to go through Romans 8, 1, which is like one of the best verses in the Bible. And so come back, man, come and join our in-person gathering next week on July 11th, because I know there's just a, there's a difference when you are with people watching the service. And I was even listening to a podcast yesterday and he talked about how, uh, you know, he doesn't think that people necessarily are craving like intimacy, like person to person closeness, but really uh, like people sensation, like the sensation of being in a crowd again, the sensation of hearing other people sing and watching other people listen and just kind of the things and the dynamics that happen in a room when you are all together, that that's actually much of what we're craving right now. It's not just necessarily the intimacy, because we can have that in other places, but the sensation of being together, of bumping shoulders in the pew to make it feel a little bit more like normal again. And so I would invite you to come next Sunday, July 11th. Uh, we'll continue to do this online service for a while, uh, but as I said, it's going to be a little bit more tapered down so that we can really invest where God has called us to invest in our in-person gatherings. So just a quick little re-upping on that and note on that. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into our text today. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it always proves effective, God. That there is never a time where your word is not spoken, where your word is spoken and it doesn't accomplish what you intend for it to accomplish. And I believe today that in the text we have, as confusing as it is, you have purposes for us today. And so I pray whatever those purposes are, God, that by your mercy and by your power, through your Holy Spirit, those purposes would be accomplished in our hearts, God. That we would feel your word speaking to us. We would feel your word leading us, calling us to understand ourselves better and what this whole Christian life is about and what it feels like so many times. And so, Father, I, I pray that you would help me in my weakness, God, that you would truly unite your power with my weak words and, as a consequence, bear fruit in our lives together here at Icon. Father, we, we love you and we entrust this time to you. We want to meet with you. We want to hear from you. And so would you do that by your grace and mercy in Jesus' name? Amen. 
Well, uh, you know, I ha I am coming up on living in Seattle for almost right at a year. So I got here July 1st of last year. So, uh, well, I guess actually by the time this airs, it will be uh, a year. And so uh, we've loved it so far. We absolutely love living here. Uh, we really, barring some crazy disaster, um, we want Seattle to be our forever home. Um, but there's been a few things that we've experienced here that are just totally different than what I uh, had known before. And it, you know, it comes in the forms of usually like some sort of natural disaster or some sort of natural event. And uh, what happens, what I've found is the people in Seattle begin to panic. You know, the heat comes or there's a wild, there's wildfire smoke and all these different things. And people in Seattle panic and run to the store. Like they run to Lowe's, they run to Home Depot. And so I've, I first experienced this when uh, I moved up here and growing up in Texas, wildfires were not a thing, you know, like we, we didn't really have those there. And so I didn't know how to be prepared. And so when that, especially last year when the wildfire smoke was so bad, I think it was bad. Um, it, it really took me off, off, off guard and I didn't know what to do. And so I did some online research and I saw, okay, well, um, you know, all the air purifiers are gone right now. So I can't go buy one of those, but apparently what I can do is get a little box fan, which we already have, uh, and then get a filter to put it on the back and kind of filter the air through. And that'll kind of help clean the air. It's kind of a, you know, it's not the most, it's not the most uh, elegant thing, but it certainly works. And so I thought, great, I already have a box fan. All I got to do is go get a filter. And so I go to Lowe's and I go to Home Depot and I am searching desperately for the good stuff, right? Like the MERS 13 filter. I'm sure you know what that is. I'm looking desperately for this thing and it, it, the, the line is just packed. Like there's nothing there. The, the best filters that are there are basically like, like paper. Like there's nothing that's really not getting through that filter. And all the filters are gone or even, you know, this week whenever the, the heat wave came through and, uh, you know, a lot of restaurants closed down. And then last night, uh, my wife and I we were like, well, we don't really want to cook in our house right now because that's just going to make this place so much hotter. So let's, let's go get some food. So I went out to go uh, get some food and we wanted Chick-fil-A. I went all the way to Bellevue in order to get some Chick-fil-A. And I have never seen a Chick-fil-A so busy. Like I'm not lying to you. It was probably 60 cars or so in the drive-thru and then another 40 people waiting at the door in order to pick up an order. Like apparently there was a, an outage up in Issaquah. And so when there's an outage, you just go further west, I guess, and go to Chick-fil-A and they were absolutely packed in the, and there wasn't like a panic there, but there was, there was some edginess to it. There was like, why, why is my order taking an hour long? And, uh, and so, yeah, there's just these things that happen in Seattle that I think people really get up in a panic and you got to run to the store in order to get the filter. You got to run to the store in order to get the, the air conditioning unit. And it's really, really strange. And we get surprised by some of these events and they just kind of throw us into a panic. And I think that's a little bit like what we are when we are confronted by our own sin. I think in a lot of us, there is a certain panic or there is a certain surprise about the sin that still exists in our lives. You see, we're just kind of going about our lives and we're living and we're having family and we're going to work and, and then something happens. We're tempted by something and we give into it or we're caught in these habits and ruts of sin. And I, 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 there's this sense of confusion of why is this still a part of me? Why, why am I still doing this? Why is this still such a temptation for me? I don't understand myself. And we get up in a panic and we get surprised by our sin and then we start running. We either just shut it down completely and just run headlong into sin or we just try to clean ourselves up. And we got to we got to get back to what we were doing. We got to set in the disciplines, like all the good stuff. But we were reacting to it because we were surprised by the sin that is still in our lives. And today in Romans 7, Paul is going to give us a very confusing passage but also one of the most relatable passages in the entire Bible. There is some vulnerability that Paul is going to lean into here that I think will help us 
in that sense of shock around our sin. That I, I don't know why I'm still doing this. I don't know why I can't get out of this. I don't know why I thought I was free from this and then all of a sudden it shows back up in my life. That sense of confusion and that sense of surprise. Paul is going to help us in that today. So throughout our series so far, we've seen how the Christian identity changes the way that we relate to sin and that we relate to the law. That when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, the truest thing about us becomes centered around who he is and what he has done. And what he has done is set us free from sin. That we're no longer enslaved to sin. We're no longer subject to every whim of its desires. But we are now free and we can live dead to sin and alive to God, like Paul says in Romans 6. And then not only that, but we're released from the law. That this, this barrier, this thing that weighed on us as a burden that we could never fulfill, we've been released from that in Jesus Christ. This thing that used to prompt sin in us, that used to bring sin out of us, both identify sin and then exacerbate sin, we're now free from it. And then last week, as Justin explored, we saw how the law in itself is not evil. The, re the reason it's good news that you are released from the law is not because the law is evil, but because you are. Because you are evil, because you take the law of God in your flesh and use it as ammunition in your continued campaign of rebellion. That you are looking, not only does the law tell you what sin is, but also it ratchets up your flesh in order to say, great, now I know exactly what to do in order to further rebel against God. And we don't say it that way, but that's what's going on. The Bible is identifying for us, putting us on display. Here's how evil our hearts are. And so today, Paul is going to have some unique on the on the heels of that talking about how our sin takes the law and although the law is good our sin is so evil it uses it for its own rebellious ends paul is now going to enter into somewhat of a vulnerable experience of how his relationship between sin and this thing called the christian life has been so far he's going to show us a lot of the confusion that we tend to have is common, is normal. The Apostle Paul himself had it. <laughs> this sense of, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I want you to see today, the title of today's message is Released from the Back and Forth. This inconsistency of doing well and then really not doing well. Doing well and really not doing well. Wanting to do this, but always doing this. That we have some release from that, not necessarily from the experience of that, but at least from its confusion. And so let's let's jump in. Romans 7, starting in verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. You see, Paul is revisiting some of what he's already explored here. That the law of God is good. The law of God did not bring death to you alone, but we have brought our own death by taking the law of God and using it for our own sinful purposes. And look how Paul describes that experience in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So the law of God comes into our lives, comes into the world and doesn't just identify for us what sin is, but exacerbates what we want in our rebellion. So we know how to rebel against God. And because of that, our sin is ratcheted up in its seriousness. That we're no longer ignorant. We're no longer just doing things and, oh, I didn't know that was wrong. But we know exactly what's wrong and we know exactly what we are doing in order to rebel against God. And that ratchets up our guilt. And I, I want us to feel that today. That 
I, sin and law, all of these things are, are kind of buzzwords in the Christian faith, in the Christian community. But they are deadly serious. That we've got to understand that word, sinful beyond measure. Man, do you think you're a good person? Our world tells us again and again and again, and even some Christian communities say this, that we are naturally good. That given the right circumstance, given the right environment, we will tend toward righteousness. We will trend toward what is good and right. The Bible says no. The Bible says that we are sinful beyond measure, that we are so caught in sin, what he says, sold under sin in the flesh, that our sin is evil, that we ourselves are sinful beyond measure, that that's the starting point for our lives as human beings, that after the fall, we now exist under sin naturally. That we, know, we, we don't tend toward what is good. We don't trend toward what is right. But we will always tend toward what is self-serving, what is about us, what will be best for us, regardless of who it affects, regardless of how it affects others, regardless of what God says. We are on this campaign to serve the king called self. That we want to serve ourselves. We want everything else in our world to serve us. The world is about us. I say this all the time, but the fall in sin has, has curved us inward. The, the old Latin phrase of homo incurvitas in se, that the, the inward curving of the human soul. The outward mirror that we were meant to be has collapsed inward, and now we are self-serving. So self-serving, as Paul says here, that that which is good, we use in order to bring our own death, to show that we are sinful beyond measure. But look at this, verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. <laughs> For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Stick with me, there's, there's some language here. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. What, what's going on there? <laughs> There's some really confusing language there. And Paul is beginning to uh, enter into some of that vulnerable expression that I talked about. That he recognizes that in the natural state, in flesh, before becoming a believer, we are sold under sin. But now that we are sinful beyond measure, but now he begins to kind of shift his language to the present tense. Because it says earlier in the text that in the past, you know, did that which is good bring death to me? No, it was me and my sin bringing the law into my own service to rebel against God. But now he comes into the present and says, right now, right now, I do not understand my own actions. Right now, I have the desire to do good, but don't do it. Right now... There is this evil in me that I don't want to do, but I keep on doing. And it's important to see the present tense here. Because there's, there's a lot of debate around this section in Romans 7, around what is Paul talking about here? Like, is this Paul before he was a believer? Or is this Paul now that he is a believer? And this is extremely important because whichever of those two we land on, is going to, to, to define how we think about the Christian life and the Christian experience towards sin. And friends, I just want to, to tell you that it, it's my conviction, and a, 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 lot have, a lot of scholars and theologians land on different sides of the fence, but it's my conviction that what Paul's doing here is describing his experience as a Christian. That this is not Paul before he became a Christian. This is not him describing a past experience, but this is actually the present tense. And how do we know that? 
Because he talks about I, I, the, 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 good that, the good that I want to do. The good that I want. Do, do unbelievers want to do good? Well, certainly in some ways they want to do good, but not in the way that Paul's talking about here. Paul's talking about a good that is in, in alignment with the law of God. And as we know from the Bible, that is not true of those who are of the flesh, of those who are unbelievers and have not been made new by the Spirit of God. But it is true for those who are believers, for those who have the Holy Spirit. They want to do good. They re- not only that, they recognize what is good, what is evil. They have discernment in order to see by the Spirit what is good, what is right in following God, and then what is evil in following our own sinful desires. This is Paul describing his experience as a Christian. And the way that he describes it is that there is this persistent, gnawing disconnect between what he wants and what he does. What he wants to do, what he wants to be, the type of Christian he wants to be, the good that he desires, and the evil that continues to haunt him. The sin that continues to come after him, that seems to win the day again and again and again. And this is exactly what I'm talking about in, in the beginning of this sermon. That each and every one of us as Christians... Having the Holy Spirit want to do good. We want to grow. We want to love Jesus more. We want to follow him. We want to be image bearers. And we want to you know, get formed back into that image apart from sin. And if we don't want that, then that shows some of what might actually be the condition of our hearts. But for believers, we want to follow God. As faint as that desire is, sometimes we want to obey. But there is a disconnect and sometimes what seems like a chasm between what we want and what we do. We want to follow God, but we continue to fall into sin. It seems like there's always something there to trip us up. Have you experienced that? Is Paul describing your experience as well? <laughs> Are you mindful of the ways that when you, when you want to do good, it doesn't seem like you can do it? When you want to follow God, it seems like there's this disconnect and even this barrier that you're hitting a wall again and again and again. That you're at a crossroads and you think, this I, I know by the Holy Spirit and by God's word that this is what is right. This is his desire for my life for my mind, for my marriage, for my kids, for my job, my career. Everything is defined by the Word of God as this is the right way, whatever that is. But then over here, there is the route of rebellion, of sin, of ease, of self-service and self selfish ambition. And it seems like when we get to that crossroad, it feels like we have more evidence uh, against ourselves that we go this way. And we are, what Paul says here, confused. I do not understand my own actions. I don't understand why I can't get it right. And he begins to describe some of his understanding. So he describes some of his confusion around this reality, but then he as he zeroes in on this, and he, he explains himself a little bit more, starting in verse 21, he begins to give some clarity to it. And this is where I really want to spend a, a good chunk of time. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And so this is where Paul begins to almost provide at least as much clarity as he can to the confusing experience of the Christian life, wanting to do right but seeming to always do evil. And the clarity that he brings is in this verse right here. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil 
lies close at hand. So he brings up that language of law again. And when he's talking about law in this context, he's not using it in the same way that he was when he was talking about the law of God, that there's these rules. But really more so, he's talking about there's this principle that he's discovered in the Christian life. This this principle that he's discovered as he's moved forward as a Christian. And what is that principle? That at the very time that he wants to do right, Evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I delight in what God says is right. I want to do what he says. I see that his way is right. I see that his way actually leads towards Shalom, that God knows better than me, (laughs) that God probably understands a little bit of what life is supposed to look like, and so his way is probably the way of flourishing. I delight in that in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, another principle waging war against the principle of my mind that delights in the law of God, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. What Paul's describing here is what theologians call indwelling sin. Indwelling sin. You see, before we become a Christian, we are, we are totally captive to sin. We've already explored that in Romans quite a bit. But then as we put our faith in Jesus, we now are made new by the Holy Spirit. And our lifelong t- trajectory is now bent toward God rather than away from Him. But that lifelong trajectory is exactly that. Lifelong. <laughs> Being made new by the Holy Spirit and wanting to do what God says, wanting to please God and to be who we were made to be as his image bearers, that desire grows and grows and grows. And it grows in relation to the sin that still exists in us. You see, there, there's, there's been some Christian thought for some time that whenever you, whenever you become a Christian, sin just kind of falls by the wayside. And we see this in, in the testimonies that we love, right? We love the sexy testimonies, don't we? The ones that say, I was addicted to heroin, I was addicted to pornography, I was addicted to alcohol, I was doing this, I was doing that. But then when I trusted in Jesus, things totally changed. And I haven't had a drop of alcohol since. I haven't shot up since. I haven't looked at that since. We love those stories because it seems like they communicate the power of the gospel. It seems like they communicate what the power of Jesus and his saving work can do. And they certainly do, but they do not tell that story. They do not compel people to see the power of Jesus Christ any more than the unsexy stories of, yeah, I became a believer, but I'm still struggling with this. It's lost its power. It's slowly losing its grip on me, but it's still in me. There's still something in me that is waging war against what I really want to do. And that is what is called indwelling sin. When you become a believer, sin does not fall by the wayside. Your relationship changes toward it, but sin does not disappear. Sin is still there. Wanting to tempt you, wanting to pull you away, wanting to get you back into old habits, wanting to convince you that the way of life before Jesus Christ was somehow better, though it led to so much frustration and angst. And then not only that, not not only is sin still in you, but what does Paul say there in verse 21? So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. So indwelling sin not just exists as as something that's there. It's not just this abstract thing in us. But Paul describes it as a strategic thing in our lives. That when you want to do right, evil is right there. That when the desire to follow God, when the desire to obey Him, to sacrifice this or to love this person this way, specifically because God calls you to. When you desire to do that, that's when sin really rears its head. That right in the moment when you want to do good, when you want to follow God, when you want to obey Him, 
Sin captures and seizes that opportunity to pull you back. If you were just living life humdrum, not really wanting to do good, not really wanting to follow God, you would never notice the power of sin and its strategic seizing of that opportunity. It's when you desire to follow God that sin then comes in and says, I'm going to take you back. I'm, I, I'm right here. I'm right here. I want to pull you back. I want to tempt you with this. So indwelling sin isn't just a, an abstract principle that's in us, but it's actually an active strategic force working in us and working against us when we want to do what is right. It's waging war against what we really want as believers, which is to love and to follow God. It's always there. It's always ready to capture us, always ready to pull us back. And in this condition, in this confusion, in this up and down of the Christian life, Paul understandably gets to verse 24 and says this, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Exacerbated just totally at his wit's end as to how to fix the problem, how to get released from this back and forth, how to not... How, he understands how wretched he is, that there's something in him that right when he wants to do good, evil lies close at hand. What's the solution to that? A wretched man who wants to do good, but sin is always there in him, in his members, in his body that wants to pull him away from God. And Paul, understandably, along with those of us with eyes to see, this is a desperate situation. How do we get out of this? And it's where I want to close. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, there is so much confusion in the Christian life, if we're honest. We don't know why we keep doing this. We don't know why we keep falling this way. And the longer that goes on, the more and more confused we get by ourselves, the more and more discouraged we get by ourselves. And we are tempted. And this is, this is a reason why I think so many people walk, walk away from the faith. You can, you can label it deconstruction, that's fine. But I think much of it is that we are so confused by the persistence of our sin and we are actually guilted by the persistence of our sin. And we thought, I, I, I thought I should be further along by now, but here I am doing the same old thing again, despite what I desire. That type of confusion can lead you into some very dark places and gone on long enough unaddressed, unclarified, can actually lead you to walk away from Jesus. Because you think, nothing's changed here. All that's happening here is I'm just discouraged by my own actions and discouraged by my own consistency. So what's the point? I'm just going to go lean into the world and what it can offer me. But another way to treat that desperation, the Christian way of treating that desperation is what Paul says here is to recognize how wretched we are. Yeah, of course, this confusion, it's terrible. The experience of the back and forth of the inconsistency is terrible. It's discouraging. It weighs us down. Yeah, feel that. But then with the same power and with the same depth and breadth of the sense of your sin, with that same breadth and depth, Feel what Paul says in first verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That there is deliverance from this. Not necessarily from the experience of it. Because we're still going to continue to struggle with sin. But at least from that sense of desperation. That sense of confusion. Why am I still doing this? Well, you can be released from that. Because you know why you're still doing it with indwelling sin. And you don't have to be weighed down as if you are the black sheep in Jesus' fold. Jesus came to save sinners and he saw us here and he sees us here even still in this experience and still delivers us. There's still freedom. There's still release. The way out of this discouraging back and forth, this 
discouraging and confusing sense of why we can't get our stuff together is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Providing not just clarity as to why we still struggle with sin, but relief and peace and the grace that continues. And the grace that continues to wash us and cleanse us. And the grace that still shows up every time when we walk away. And the grace that doesn't wait for us to get out of this back and forth, doesn't wait for us to be more consistent. The grace that washes us, that Jesus Christ our Lord knows exactly who we are and knew exactly what he was getting into when he died. He's not surprised by your sin like you are. He's not surprised when you fall again. He's not, dis he's not surprised. He's not shocked that you still fail. He knew exactly what he was getting into when he, ran, when he went to that cross. He saw you in your struggle and your back and forth. He saw that with eyes wide open and still went to the cross. That can give us relief. Even if it's not release from the experience because God wants to teach us those, some things in that back and forth, it's at least relief that that back and forth doesn't define who you are to God but that Jesus Christ, our Lord, does. And so, are, I mean, are you surprised by your sin? Jesus isn't. And it doesn't, as much as your sin makes you, and the confusion of your sin makes you want to draw back, makes you want to faint away out of discouragement, your experience with sin, your struggle with sin, actually moves the heart of Jesus towards you, friends. To love you, to give you grace, and to get down and just say, let's get back up again. Let, let, let's keep walking. That's what the grace of Jesus can do. That in this experience of wanting to do good but never doing it. Not wanting to do evil but seeming like you're always doing it. Grace picks you back up. And gives you relief to keep going. To keep walking. And next week we're going to explore some of the foundational objective glorious pieces of that salvation. That even in this, there's no condemnation. But for today, just get back up. Where you are in the back and forth, where you are wanting to do good, but always doing evil. Would you just get back up? Would you just see that Jesus loves you all the same? His grace is not moving away from you, but towards you in that experience. And that though you are surprised by your sin, surprised at how long this thing has gone on. Jesus is not. And he's not going to. He's not going to get surprised by your sin. So he's never going to leave you even in your failure. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you for the relief that we have in this exhausting struggle with sin. There is, there is the desire in our hearts to do good. We want to follow you. We want to love you. We want to grow as Christians. We, we see your beauty. We see your grace. We see your love. We see your worth and value. And we want to live lives that match up with that worth. And yet here we are still, God. Running back to old ways, old habits. And God, I just pray for my friends here that when that happens, when there's a chasm between desire and action, God, I pray that your grace would pick them back up again. That they would say the way forward is not their own self-wrought perfection, but the way forward is the grace of Jesus Christ that cleanses us, that saves us, that makes us secure, that doesn't make us dependent on our own inconsistent pitiful performance, but on the objective, rock-solid performance of Jesus Christ that is now given to us by faith. God, would you pick us back up? Would you, Grace, help us to keep going, even in the confusion, even in that chasm between desire and action? Would you, Grace, compel us forward? In Jesus' name, amen.